Hello, I'm Ben Grosser. I'm an artist who focuses on the cultural, social, and political effects of software, thinking about how the way interfaces and other software systems are designed can have profound effects on those who use them and often are designed intentionally in order to manipulate users into the production of data and other kinds of activities um, that are to the benefit of big tech and large platforms and often to the detriment of users and humans and democracy. And so I make artworks often using code that gets in between the user and the system uh, changing that experience in some way, um, allowing them to experience platforms in a different light. I got my start in music composition, writing code to generate sound. In, in my case, always trying to find a way to generate sounds I'd never heard, often very loud and ugly sounds. So I, that, this was the time at which the internet, the internet had been around, but when the web emerged, the World Wide Web, uh, mid 90s. It was an exciting time that I think I was just as excited about all the, the potential opportunities that a lot of people were talking about at the time and op uh, a way perhaps to escape some of the societal ills that we had erected for ourselves as a, as a civilization. Um, racism, sexism, inequality, all these things. This was kind of in the air in the, in the late 90s, like maybe we can make a new space. Of course, it didn't work out that way. Um, and it was kind of naive perhaps to think that we could not take ourselves with us when we went online. I think I still like to think about that moment of hope for doing something different as inspirational. And then definitely what's happened in the last 15 years with the rise of big tech and Silicon Valley's dominance and monopoly platforms and you know, what's commonly referred to as the emergence of Web 2.0. Like my current way of looking at the world through code grows out of my initial experiences of social media in the 2007, 2008, to 2010 era when Facebook and Twitter, and these platforms were new and they were kind of like the alternative way to communicate over what had been there before. They were exciting times. It was, it seemed like a really interesting way to connect, but as they got bigger and as the systems grew and as their intentions changed uh, towards overt goals to produce profit and growth at any cost, um, I started perceiving my own kind of affective changes when using these interfaces. And that's kind of what ends up being becoming the, the inspiration for a lot of the things that I do. How do I feel when I use these? What is it about the design of the interface that makes me feel that way? How could I manipulate that exchange, that interface, such that I could better understand what's happening in that exchange between myself, between human and computer? Where is the data going? Who benefits? And it just animates a lot of larger questions. So that's kind of how I got to where I am now. I would say a primary characteristic that defines my laptop, which is my primary computing interface, um, is density and, well, just craziness um, often, I think is how some people would think about it. I've always got a ton of desktops open. I've always, uh, every browser often is tens or you know more tabs in a, in a browser, lots of browser windows. Um, I've probably closed a few things intentionally in the last few days thinking I can't have everything open at once and don't want this to crash. So, you know, here I've got, I don't know, 12 or so desktops open. And, you know, they, they just, they kind of, the idea is that each desktop is a project in progress. The, the truth is that over time it's, it gets all mixed up, but often I'll have uh, terminal windows open to servers. This is a page where I'm working on a, one of the projects for the exhibition. There'll be ones where I'm just doing more searches and text documents and things like that. Right now I end up wanting to close things. Uh, but yeah, you know, just going through, right? So more things I'm working on. This is uh, just more searching. This is screen grabs, um, trying to, to generate material. Um, so this is from my Go Rando project. This is from a project called Not For You, which will also be in the exhibition. Um, this is just a Photoshop window where I've been working on, this is the a generic, I mean, I just grabbed this from somewhere, uh, open source icons, um, for kind of generic person. This is a logo, so this is Illustrator. So just doing kind of logo design. 
um, for new projects in the exhibition. Final Cut, this is, I'm working on a, a film that will be in the show and some of the data that goes into that sh that film and, and manipulations of audio for it. And then this is a thing where I'm kind of long-term testing um, to make sure this infinitely scrolling, never-ending web page doesn't crash anything, research and, and other work. So that's kind of a general uh, kind of feel for things. And, um, you know, it's just, it's always this condition of kind of, what to a lot of people might feel like chaos, um, but to me, it's uh, controlled chaos, I guess. Like it, it, it's a chaos that makes sense to me, even though it's uh, kind, of a, kind of a mess. One of the new projects that will be in the exhibition really grows out of uh, an awareness that I was kind of coming to of just how diverse the notification messages are on a number of social media platforms. And in my case, I decided to focus on Facebook for this particular work, but I basically spent a number of, I don't know, six months, bits at a time, looking closely at this list of notifications, really thinking about what is the language that is used, that is constantly being pushed into our consciousness. If you go to Facebook, a lot of people, of course, have notifications turned on on their mobile device. So they're seeing these notifications pop up in their day um, all day long. When you look, start to look at these, you realize that there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of techniques going on in trying to get your attention. You know, the, the whole purpose, the whole design, the, the, the ideology of big tech platforms is engagement. And so if I look at this list of notifications, you know, it's Jeff Thompson posted in a group, or I have memories with this other person, or this person added to his story, see it before it disappears, right? It's like everything is kind of like a what I've come to think of is almost a seduction. It's like, hey, somebody's focused on you. Come on in, take a look, see what's happening. Or there's new information that's going to change your your way of thinking, whatever it is. There's Someone wants to be your friend. So I decided to start recording uh, these messages as they came across, like capturing the the structure of this language to, to analyze it. And so I started building a, a spreadsheet that has maybe the, the original, you know, Ashley added eight new photos. Um, someone added to their story. Dorothy also commented on Jeff's post. Erin also commented on her post, et cetera. I started to just abstract them a bit. So someone also commented on their post or someone changed their profile picture or someone and somebody else commented on your post. And I was thinking about what's the verb, you know, what's the structure. And it's essentially I'm depersonalizing notifications to try to analyze what, how do they plug our personal data into these templates in a way that tries to uh, seduce you back onto the system to, the way I think about it is to get you involved in a one-sided romance where you do all the work, where you do all the contribution, you do all the thinking. So one of the works that we're going to have, I'm going to have in the, in the exhibition is called, its title is Platform Sweet Talk. And this is the, the base kind of um, presentation of what it's going to look like. So um, there's going to be, and there's going to be three different screens, um, each with these messages that um, are derived from the notification analysis that I did over many months. Someone commented on a post that you're tagged in, um, you know, whatever the message is. It's a way of like getting a little bit of distance from them and thinking about what is happening in this exchange. How does it work? Why might we be attracted to it? And how does it look when it's not your name? plugged in or your friend's name plugged into this predetermined template that is really just about getting you to engage. A site like Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or any social media platform, without us spending all day long contributing to these systems, putting our data into them, they're just empty containers. That's all they are. And they're empty containers that are that are very homogenous. Um, they homogenize users. And so another work that I'll have in the in the exhibition um, is this work called SafeBook, where it's really it's an ex it's a browser extension that just hides all the content. So you can look at what is the structure of this system? How does my profile page look different from someone else's profile page when it doesn't have the image that I submitted that they allowed me to put in a very particular place and crop it? a certain way. And so this is one example of how I think we can 
look at the banality of a social media platform and even make it more so in order to better understand it. I think they I think they had I think Mark Zuckerberg had his moment where MySpace had gotten crazy. And so he came along with a clean interface. And that was uh, he was riding an aesthetic wave at the time. And, and that maybe allowed him to mythologize how bad the craziness of a space like MySpace was versus the, the, the clinical kind of clean presentation of a site like Facebook. The structure and the presentation and the aesthetics of a place like Facebook are all engineered in service of the goals of the corporation. And that goal is growth and engagement and data collection. You know, that's three goals, but they're all kind of intertwined. The reason the boxes have so little... Uh, opportunity for us to manipulate is because it forces us to conform to the way they want us to present ourselves. I remember back in 2010, for example, Facebook used to have on the profile text boxes where you could just type anything you wanted, all kinds of different text boxes. And they would have, you know, put your favorite quotes in this box or put your interests in that box or put your favorite movies in this box. And you could just type, but you could type whatever you wanted in those boxes. And even though they were still defining where the boxes are, at least it was a little bit of variation. Net. Then they changed everything. They actually erased. They took everything everybody had seen in those boxes, threw most of it out one day. When they could, they replaced like your list of movies with, with links to the page for that movie on Facebook. They want us as easily digestible as data sources as possible. Variation is not their friend. Nuance is not their friend. They want to be able to say to an advertiser, this box will get you these people in this age group with this color, um, you know, this, this place they come from, this kind of income level, this kind of set of interests. But those are all have to be in a, in a computable way. They have to be in a form that they can write a database query for it. And if everybody's writing their own little version of, of what they're interested in, in text, that becomes a lot harder problem to parse as opposed to clicking on a list of links of different pages of the bands that you most admire. That's really what drives the structure of, of the homogeneity of these sites. There's going to be a pair of films present when you first enter the exhibition, kind of flanking you a little on the left and right when you enter. One is a film I made two years ago called Order of Magnitude. And this is a uh, you know, even though most of the time I write code to get in between the user and the system to change their experience of the platform, I decided I wanted to step back and really think about who makes software and why and what we could learn by listening to what they say. And I chose Mark Zuckerberg as kind of the quintessential um, Silicon Valley CEO. And I, I assembled every video recording, publicly available video recording of him from his first emergence in 2004 at age 19 up through the end of 2018 when I was making I was making this film in early 2019. So basically 15 years of his life and the 15 years of Facebook. I then treated those videos as an archive to mine for three things. I extracted every time he spoke the word more, every time he spoke the word grow or growth, and every time he uttered a metric, a number, 1 million, 2 billion. And I wanted to make a supercut of just that material. And I thought, you know, that'll probably add up to a long supercut of five minutes, which would be pretty long on in internet supercut land. But I thought it'd be interesting to see how long it gets and, and what it looks like and, and feels like. And so I started making that work and uh, I got to five minutes pretty quickly. And then I got to 10 minutes and I got to 15. And I started to really get worried that nobody was ever going to watch uh, 15 minutes of Mark Zuckerberg saying more. And by the time I was done, it was 47 minutes long. The scale of the of the outcome is is very much reflective of kind of the theme of of the project in the first place. That just looking at these videos that he's been captured in, that it would add up to 47 minutes saying the word more and numbers is is pretty striking. I'll just play like a few seconds of it here so you can get a sense. It's growing really quickly. More than 40 percent, more than a third of a few thousand more schools. I think I have like 15,000 pending friend requests. More in few thousand, 100 or 200. The 100 or 200, six million, six million. 100 million, 100 billion of more, hundreds of thousands. It's more, it's much sharing more information, cheaper the growth, more of it, more engaging, and that users trust more are going to be the ones that spread through the system. And so it kind of just goes through his life as he gets older and as the corporation grows. More than everyone else, more than half, more, 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 more grow, growing growth team, growing more, about a billion, five billion to billion, billions of more, 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 a lot more, more will be more, it's going to be a lot more.
85,000. And, and so you kind of see him grow over time. You see his language evolve. You see the numbers go up because, of course, that's what he's focused on. It, it's a way of thinking about what's happening. And then so this, I released this one two years ago, and I decided for uh, the Arbite uh, show that I wanted to do a companion piece to Order of Magnitude that would look at the same archive. What if we looked at exactly the same archive? And instead of looking for how much he talked about more or grow or metrics, what if we just looked at how much he speaks about less? How many times does he say the word less? How long does it add up to? And if I make a super cut of that. And so that's the work that'll be on the right when you walk in and it's called deficit of less. And so I went through the same archive and I extracted every time he spoke the word less and I assembled it all together. My idea was presuming it was going to be shorter than order of magnitude. I'm going to stretch it so that it takes the same amount of time as order of magnitude, about 47 minutes long. And it turns out that the supercut of all of the times he spoke less over 15 years adds up to less than a minute of footage. I'm ending up having to stretch this video to 47 times its original length. So slowing it down 47 times. And so I'm still working on um, some of this, but this gives you a, a little bit of an idea. Let me go back a little bit, see some of the same footage. And so this is just Mark Zuckerberg saying the word less. That's like, that's all it is. In fact, if we look at the original, which um, this will be kind of nice exclusive content because I won't be showing this in the exhibition, but this is the, um, this is the real time version. Less, even less, less than less, 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 less than even less. Less, less, a little less than less, less, less than plus, less than plus, less, 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 less. less. But instead of 47 minutes, it's less than a minute is what we end up with. So now I'm working on all these ways of how am I going to deal with the sound? Like, for example, I'm looking at techniques to like really stretch it and kind of get it into an eerie, slow state. And so you'll be able to kind of see, in fact, we're even talking about now we're going to sync these precisely so that order of magnitude starts at exactly the same time as deficit of less. They're exactly the same length. And on this side, it'll be more, 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 grow, grow, grow. And this side, it'll be the, the very slow down, kind of eerie, sparse uh, presentation of, of less as a concept that he thinks about. The title of the show is Software for Less. And I've spent a lot of my time as an artist focused on mining or revealing or making visible or making it helping people have a, a, a reconfigured affective experience of these platforms, which are all designed to produce more. They're trying to activate in us a, our our de desire for more, a need to feel valued. We, you know, we evolved as a species with a need to feel valued. It's, it's esteem, we, with a need for esteem, a need to feel valued, whether it's by ourselves or by others, confidence in ourselves or feeling valued by others. And this need worked really well for humans as a species for almost all of our history. But in the last 100, 200, whatever number of years, that need for esteem, that need to feel valued has got has become contemporary with capitalism, where value is quantifiable and growth is a constant requirement for success. Social media platforms and the way they're designed perverts that overlap in a way that it gets us all focused on how much are we valued on the social media platform? How many likes do we get? How many followers do I have? How much do people share what I post? So we've become obsessed. And some of my work, and I've done work on hiding metrics on social media platforms and trying to help people you know, just experience these, these spaces differently. But it made me, as part of this show, Software for Less, um, where I really wanted to be thinking about what if we did it differently? What if instead of building software platforms always focused on more and growth, what if we focused instead on generating platforms that by design want less from us, not more, that don't produce compulsions to use them, that don't use metrics at all, perhaps, to, to activate us? And so that I, I basically decided I needed to prototype my own social media platform to, to try to see how it could be different. So I, one of the works that's going to be in the exhibition is this new social media platform called Minus, um, available at minus.social. And its key characteristic is that 
every user when they sign up gets 100 posts for life and that's it. You post your 100 and you're out. Um, you can see here the it's foregrounding for me this quality that I can write whatever I want. This is a status box, just like at the top of Twitter or the top of Facebook. But if I want to post something, whatever it is, you know, I really enjoyed, uh, I'll just enjoyed my green tea today, whatever, and I post it. Okay, but that's it. There's 14 remaining now. Um, and as soon as I get to zero, I can't do this anymore. In other words, there's, there's a something finite about the opportunity uh, to post on this platform, uh, mirroring in a lot of ways, the ways that the humans are, you know, we are finite <laughs> and our capacity and our time and our energy is finite and the, the resources of the planet are finite. And so in some ways, the platform is reflecting that in a certain way. And when you look at posts on the feed, the only metric is this one about how many posts you have left and that single metric only goes down, which is different from likes and followers and shares, and retweets and all the other numbers that are always going up. And each post tells you, whenever you see a, a user on the post, you see how many posts they have left. So Janelle has 99, Rod Nim's got 99. These are people who've just signed. So Soren's got 93, but it also tells you how many posts they had left when they posted this particular content, because maybe there's a bit more stakes for someone on their last five than on their first five, just kind of as an example. It's kind of like, what if we reimagined the idea of a social media platform, obviously taking cues from some of the useful parts that have been developed already. Um, it's got things like I can't, if I want to reply, I can't just type my reply right here. It's going to take me to the page where I have to see all of the other replies and then I can type my reply. Trying to get people into that space of paying attention to the content rather than the numbers, rather than trying to generate content that amplifies their own metric presentation. Because the design of a Twitter or a Facebook is so focused on getting us to be attentive to our metrics, to writing content. I mean, the purpose of a, of a like count, a visible like count or a visible retweet count is to teach us to write content, to submit content that gets the best metric performance. The more metric performance, the more data there is about all of the users around you. So if you post something that goes viral, that gives you the that kind of dopamine hit that that high metric performance can produce. But it also means it's producing the maximal amount of data about who else on the platform likes that particular piece of content. And how does that relate to the other pieces of content that they've liked? So it's all sitting there designed to get us to post things that are metric performance. Uh, you know, they're really good in terms of metric performance, get likes, get retweets. So Minus is really, it's a platform by design that wants less, not more. It, it wants us to think about what it is we're gonna post. And you can burn them out in a day if you want, right? Like there's there's no limitation on the of the tempo of your posts over time. You could post one a year, two every year, whatever it is. You can choose to do with that what you want, but it is a finite resource. Continuous endless growth is a condition that is literally just killing the planet to just take one kind of example in terms of climate change and, and climate crisis and where things are headed in the next 50 to 100 years. But it's also a condition that feels really active in personal life from my perspective, and I think for many others, this feeling that the demands on our time and the ways in which we're expected to be present, how that affects how we feel, what we do, what we think is interesting or not. It's, it's affecting us. It's changing how we act and think about ourselves and what we do with our days and our time and how we burn out our hundred posts, or you might think of it as our hundred years, or, you know, the, the concept of the work is intertwined with thinking about not just how much time we're spending online in often in service of platform profit, how this drive to produce and to make more all the time, that more is always better than less, that adding is always better than subtracting. This is a, a, an ideology, a way of thinking that really comes from capitalism, I, I would say, and that 
has become perverted to such an extent that we're stretched really, a lot of us are really tired and stretched really thin and, and working multiple jobs. And it, it, it's the condition that is kind of a quality that's really present in so much of contemporary life. And I want the platform to be a space of thinking, not just about platforms, although that is certainly a primary focus, but more broadly about how we're living, how it feels to live now, and just propositions for how it could be different. This is why I'm both building alternative platforms, but also doing a lot of work on big tech platforms, right? The big tech platforms are where the people are. Hashtag delete Facebook, which comes along every two months or six months or whatever, and kind of has popularity on Twitter, doesn't do anything. Like, yeah, maybe a couple people quit, but it's really hard to quit these platforms because it's where our friends are and it's where the media is and it's where information is accessed. And for some people, it's part of their job or it's part of their family life. So we have to be in both places. We have to be working on and imagining and thinking about different alternatives. So at the same time, we have to, from my perspective, we have to be on the on the big tech platforms, examining them, critiquing them, manipulating them, playing, trying to find a space that allows people to imagine alternatives as an interesting option in the first place, rather than just going with what's been produced. Inevitably, honestly, a lot of my projects are more than anything else, they're about helping individual users of these systems kind of develop a criticality for themselves. This is how I feel. And so I make work about how I feel when I use these platforms. I hope that users of these projects that I make develop their own criticality for their use, where they then see, oh, this platform pulls me in this way. That might be different than what Ben does or what somebody else feels, but it allows them to start seeing and feeling what's happening rather than just being stuck you know, being manipulated and, and, and inside the system itself.